from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This is kind of a reunion because Abdullah Ibrahim and I have not seen each other in a very long time, but we do go back to New York where he had recently arrived and uh, we did manage to spend some time together there and it was wonderful to see you again looking great and sounding marvelous. There was a concert last night of your trio, which was beautiful. And we've had a chance to talk a while and reminisce a little bit. And uh, I think what we're going to do now is to find out about all the things that you've been up to since then, <laughs> <laughs> which would probably yeah. take us about a year. Yeah. And, uh, but to begin with, I, I remember that one of the the thing that we did together was a concert at in the garden at the Museum of Modern Art in New yeah. York, and uh, that was a great evening, and I'm sure that you remember a little bit about that. Yes, I do, and uh, then thank you. Uh, it's great to see you again. You are looking very well. Um, always fond memories and uh, my deepest appreciation because when I first came to New York, uh, you really supported me, right, one hundred percent. I always remember that. Very, very, very kind of you. Uh, yeah, I remember this concert very vaguely. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was with, with uh, Bayard Lancaster. Ah, with Bayard, yeah. And Morris Goldberg. And Morris, you there? Who was a fellow South, South African. African. Yeah. And uh, Sonny Brown was the drummer. Yeah. And uh, I found a review from Downbeat way back. And uh, let's see. Uh, Oh, Junior Booth was Junior the Booth, yeah. yeah. He just came, he just <laughs> arrived in New York shortly. He was from uh -huh. Buffalo. Uh -huh. Great bass player, you know. All right. You know, I remember that. And then, and then I went on to form a trio with, uh, with Byatt Lancaster and Callow Scott, the cellist. Oh, Callow. Oh, he was a wonderful player, Ooh, yeah. Wasn't he something? Yeah. Yeah. He just made a handful of records, not enough, yeah. and people don't know about him yeah. anymore. No. No. And that was such an unusual instrument in, in you know, jazz. Yes. Yeah. yeah, cello. And uh, I, I was interested in playing cello since I was a kid. And when I got uh -huh. to New York, I, I got a little cello and started playing. <laughs> but then uh, I, I met, uh, met Callow. And uh, then uh, Kello also introduced us to Kodai. And of course, Kodai cello suites uh, really resonates with, also with, with, with our dynamic of our understanding how can we expand the, the, the harmonic uh, and rhythmic uh, possibilities. Uh, so I formed a trio with, with Bad Lancaster on bass clarinet and, and Kello on a on cello and myself on piano. And then uh, I went to a New York club, I can't remember what it was, and I said, uh, would you like to book me? I've got a trio. And they said, fine, but when we pitched up there the night, they didn't want to pay me, because if that's not a trio. You see, a trio is bass. <laughs> <laughs> they really said Yeah, that. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me almost 50, 60 years to create it again. And that was the unit that we saw last night. Yes. Yeah, it was yes. This, this, uh, this idea. That was a, yeah. It's a beautiful combination. It, it really, it's a special sound. Of course, yeah. uh, there is doubling on the 
reeds, and we, we heard quite a bit of piccolo, which piccolo, is an yeah. instrument you don't encounter too yeah. often in jazz. Yeah. And he played it beautifully. Ah, he's an yeah. incredible, yeah. incredible, wonderful player. And also uh, uh, Cliff, Ga Cliff Guyton, uh, flute player, uh, and clarinet, and uh, piccolo. The, uh, the cello and bass player, uh, Noah Jackson. This is his first gig out of college. Really? Yeah. <laughs> oh. He came out of college last year and, and joined us. Hmm. And uh, quite, uh, I think this is uh, 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 the younger generation of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of musicians who are tec very technically skilled, but also have the passion, you know, also locked into the tradition. Well, he's a fine cellist, and it's interesting. Again, it, usually when the cello was used in jazz, it was pizzicato, pizzicato. but he bows. He bows, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah Callo Scott at that time told me, he said he, pl he played it amplified. You know, so he amp uh, amplified the, the cello and slung it and then stood up with it. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, so, Callo, why do you do this? So he said, I wanted to get away from the drummer <laughs> 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 because they always place him right next to the drummer unamplified. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I saw Carlo. I think not not with you, unfortunately, but yeah. I, I saw him live once at the at the Half Note, which oh, was a nice yeah. club in downtown. Yeah, I remember Manhattan. Half Note. Yeah. 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 They had very good food too, which was unusual. <laughs> <laughs> Most jazz clubs, they, yeah. in the Village Vanguard, they had nothing. They nothing never exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long did you stay in New York at that time in the sixties? Uh, it was quite a long time. We stayed at least what's it, 30, 30, 30 years. 30 years uh, at various, various places. But then we ended up uh, at, uh, at the Chelsea Hotel. That's where we actually stayed uh, for, for quite quite a long time with, with Satima and her children, Sakwe and Sidi. And I had come from, from, from Cape Town to New York, uh, like a, a scouting party to come and look for accommodation, you see. Mm -hmm. And then the family would follow. And then Don Cherry introduced me to Stanley Bard, who was then the manager of the, of the Chelsea Hotel. And that's where we stayed. And, uh, well, it was an art artist uh, colony of artists. And, mm. Yes, the Chelsea was a famous hotel on 23rd Street? 23rd Street, Street yes. yeah. Yes. But it afforded us because uh, uh, when the children had to go to school, it was a walk away. Uh, anywhere that you wanted to go, you wanted to go down to the village. You know, cause, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a good location. And then, yeah. as you say, you know, a lot of artists lived there, yeah. interesting people. And it was more or less of a residential hotel. It was, a, it was residential, yeah. yeah. And then a few... A few years, about two years, three years ago, it all changed when it, it changed the ownership. Yeah. ownership of it. And yeah, so then we we had to move out. But then it it, it took some time before you went back I, home. Yeah, I I went back shortly in 70, 74. And uh, then it became like most, for most of us during that time, it became totally unbearable because it was very, very suppressive. And uh, then we uh, left and then didn't return until until uh, Mandela was released from was 98. And you performed at Nelson Mandela's inauguration. Yeah. You? What was that like? That must have been special. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite something. The thing that I remember most that we had this uh, 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 
it was almost like unconscious fear that we were not supposed to be there, you know, because it happens all of a sudden, so suddenly. You know, in a place like Pretoria, where you would even be wary during those years to walk, mm -hmm. to walk the streets. And uh, it was, it was exhilarating, and it was sometimes confusing also because it was too much to handle. <laughs> <laughs> too much to handle at the, at the same time. But the inauguration was, was really remarkable because there were close, or close to a million people at, at the union buildings where we never could go, we never went. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for me, I, and I mean, there were, uh, it, it, it went on for hours and hours. And I met all the, the musicians and, 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 and other artists who performed. But the, the display was incredible. Because yeah. it was a military, military display of, of strength. And just to see how they, they had managed to handle this transition without, without major conflict. Yeah, well, there have been some tremendous changes there over your lifetime. Yes. Um, the, go ahead. It was a, we always understood that uh, the, that period after the change would be very, very difficult. And this is some of the, the uh, problems that we face now, because in some, in some ways we, well, not, uh, we didn't prepare ourselves uh, to, to, to handle, to handle it, handle it properly. Uh, but I'm quite amazed that in spite of all the, the, the negativity, there is such a, there are people there who are unsung. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, working behind the scenes, of very dedicated and and also very knowledgeable, also have, and also have the vision, mm -hmm. you know, for for the people. So we are <coughs> we we're hopeful. Mm. You make your home now in in Cape Town. Is that where you have your Sort of main residence yeah, because well, you travel so much. <laughs> right now, I'm at, I'm at the Hyatt. <laughs> <laughs> the Hyatt Regency in Washington. But I have a, a, a base with my fiance in uh, Germany. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, Where? Kimse. Oh, Kimse is, is beautiful. What yeah. good is yeah. <laughs> Kimse, yeah. <laughs> My grandmother had a place not far from Kimse, so I knew that region you know when I was region. a child. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, wow, quite, quite beautiful. Uh, uh, so my fiance, Dr. Marina Omari, she's a, a medical medical doctor, and uh, so she invited me to, to 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 come because at some point uh, I had an illness that I had to that I had to deal with. Oh. And through, uh, through her, through her uh, assistance, it, uh, the problem problem was, uh, was solved. You see, and that's one of the reasons why I went. There. The other reason was that uh, most of the work at that time was in, in Europe. You know? So to commute from South Africa to, to, to Europe in the northern hemisphere is a bit <laughs> is a bit tricky, and and also. <laughs> My dream instrument has always been a fazioli piano. Oh. You know, and of course, when you're, you're a pianist and you get an instrument like that, you have to have home. And uh, so fazioli factory uh, um, is, uh, is about four hours drive from where we are, in Trieste, near Trieste. Oh, oh, so Trieste. it's just across the border. Oh, yeah. and, uh, so I know, I know Paolo, from the very first years when he started uh, creating the piano. So he invited me to, to, his, uh, to his factory. I did a concert there and then I, I said, okay, let me try and buy, buy, buy an instrument, but now you must have a home to produce. So that's why I'm in Kimse. You know, and I can, beautiful instrument. Mm. 
I don't no. think I've ever seen one. They're, they're not mass manufactured, are they? No, he is a, I think he creates about a hundred or fifty or seventy-five per, per, per year, mm -hmm. but uh, it takes time to mature. Uh -huh. You know, he's uh, very meticulous on, on, on the sound and and the materials that he use that he uses, and the instrument is really it's it's an incredible instrument. It's one of the instruments that really that resonates with you. You don't have to fight with it. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I can imagine that that is very important to you because you get such a beautiful sound from the piano. You have a very special touch, and you you know you 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 just create a very special kind of feeling from that instrument. Some people use it very percussively, yeah. but you have a really beautiful almost romantic way of... Oh, thank you very much. Welcome. I'm, I'm still my fiancé that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it, comes, it comes through, uh, through uh, trial, trial and error. It's just what, what, is the, what is the best method to, to, to transmit what you what you what you what you're really feeling, and I discovered that if you just work acoustically with the sound in the venue, mm -hmm. instead of amplifying everything first, mm -hmm. you know. So, like if we if we play a, a bigger concerts, for example, with a with, with a group, uh, I suggest to the sound engineers that we first play acoustically. And we can hear each other on on stage, mm -hmm. and then transport this into the into the, you know into the into the hall. And so I've developed this uh, uh, maybe one of the sense and technique that I can I can actually hear at what uh, level of volume I should strike strike the note mm -hmm. for it to reach, <coughs> you know, to fill to fill mm -hmm. the space. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really there's so much. Music is over amplified these days and unnecessarily. I mean, there, yeah. you know, there are clubs in New York where you could hear perfectly well without, you know, having a bunch of microphones on stage. But they always put them there. And once they amplify the drums, then they have to <laughs> amplify everything else. <laughs> 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 so I once did something, I had a very short career as a concert producer. It wasn't anything that I did primarily, but uh, I was friendly with George Wayne, and so he yeah. asked me to do a few things. And I wanted to, because Carnegie Hall has such great sound, yeah. and uh, when Stan Getz played there, yeah. the first thing he said, turn off the mic. Yeah. And everybody would, you know, looked at each other. What, what does he mean? And start yeah. you know, Stan had a beautiful sound, and it yeah. carried it. So I got the idea of doing a duet at the concert of acoustic duets <laughs> at Carnegie Hall. Ah, okay. And uh, yeah. it came out quite yeah, nicely. Think, yeah. It did. Yeah, yeah. Yes, of us we 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 normally play uh, acoustic. If it's a larger venue, then uh, we ask the engineer just to put a touch of it and and uh, and uh, and work from the nat the nat natural sound. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the, the the engineers have to earn their keep, you see, oh. so they <laughs> have to be seen yeah. to turn it up. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't want to be made obsolete, of course. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. You spent some time at the Library of Congress, which is where oh. we are now. Did you find it interesting? Quite amazing. Well, quite amazing. I had no, I had no idea the, the, the scope and, and and quality. It's quite, <laughs> it's quite something. I was totally, totally blown away. And of course, working uh, with Larry. Um, he introduced me and, and took out some of the, the, the 
you know, the scores and charts. Yeah. Well, quite incredible to, to see them. And some of them I've been trying to track down for <laughs> some time. Yeah. Uh, I remember I've been looking at, a, at Ellington's uh, a turquoise, on a turquoise cloud. And uh, so uh, Larry showed me, showed me the charts. Uh, uh, and incredible, you, you know, remember that, that Ellington asked me to, to work at Tempo Music in New York. He asked me to help uh, pull, the, pull the, the publishing company together. And also I used to transcribe some of his, mm -hmm. some of the music, like uh, the, the, the Virgin Island Suite. When he came back from the, they just had tapes. So, so I transcribed it and then submitted it. You see. And then I had uh, some of my own compositions. So when Larry pulled out this Ellington, <laughs> there were my my transcriptions, uh, my transcriptions yeah. there also. I uh, yeah. feel quite honored. <laughs> that's, that's fascinating. And you know, it's com completely off table, but just uh, about two weeks ago, I re-listened to that Virgin Islands suite for the first time in really? years, so yeah. it seems that you should mention <laughs> it. Maybe I had a premonition. Premonition, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember, uh, where was it again? Uh, and, yeah, and Larry showed me the address also of, of Tempo Music. But his sister was running, he was in his sister's house, in Ruth's house. Yeah. Did you ever visit Ruth in her apartment in, uh, in New York? That's where the, yeah. the publishing company Everything was. Everything was white. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was an amazing place <laughs> on Central Park South. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well. And for me it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was wonderful to be there because I could really access some of Ellington's uh, 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 music, you know, the scores of first hand. Of course, it gave me a good uh, schooling in in uh, the business of publishing. You met Ellington in in Switzerland, right? Switzerland, yeah. Yeah, we were playing in this little club, and uh, we met a lot of uh, American musicians because they passed through on concerts. I met Errol Garner, the Messengers. Uh, that's when I first met uh, uh, Wayne Shorter. Oh. Uh, a lot of them came through. Coltrane later. And uh, but this club that <laughs> we played in, we we knew that Ellington was coming. But the, the club owner didn't want to let us uh, let us off. You see. So Satima went to the concert, and we had finished. In fact. The club owner was just uh, uh, locking up. Oh. When Satima arrives with Ellington and his entourage, wow. I don't know today how she managed. <laughs> what did she say to Ellington? <laughs> but he came and uh, okay, we went the trio and asked us to play. We played a, played a few pieces and and then a few days later he took us to Paris to record. Um, he was A and R man for. For a priest record, you know, for, uh, Frank Sinatra's right, right. <laughs> it, it was incredible because when we got into the studio, he said to Satima, "So what do you do?" And she says, "I sing." And I said, "Okay, we'll start with you." <laughs> and that's how uh, I recorded uh, what do they call it, an afternoon in Paris, which was then later later released. It was not released at the same time uh, when my, my, my recording was released. It was a learning experience. Ellington was an amazing man, wasn't he? He was... Uh... <laughs> yeah, he was... Uh, almost, uh, it always reminded me of this, uh, this wise old man in the village. No, you have to watch what you say, like Mandela. Uh, I was amazed with, you, uh, with Mandela when you, 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 you have not to say anything. 
And when you start saying it, actually, you realize that you put your foot in your mouth. <laughs> 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 because there's all the answers in, in, in Ellington. Um, almost like that seventh sense of understanding. You know, almost like, like foreseeing. Um, and I think it's, maybe, it's, it's a quality that, that, that we try to develop as, a, as jazz musicians. This uh, almost anticipation, not just in the music, but in, in one's life, uh -huh. to, to develop this, uh, this uh, uh, propensity to see in others what, what is deeply embedded and how we can uh, resonate with such. And Ellington was a master. He was a master at that. And also his response, you know, how he respond to, to, to the situation was quite masterful. Yeah, he knew how to bring out the special quality in, in, in a musician. And, and yeah. in some cases, <laughs> once they left him, they never recaptured from, that. From, you know. Yeah, from that. Yeah, that was one of the things that I learned, learned, learned from him is that uh, when I started writing, writing for uh, wider instruments, wider than the piano. So, so you actually, you write for the musician. You know, so you, uh, that specific ability or that specific sonority that the musician has and then uh, 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 write the song for that specific individual instead of the other way around, instead of just writing music and then to say, telling people that they have to play it. Yeah. And I think this is why he had this, uh, and of course uh, <laughs> the, the, the great thing is was that he had uh, the orchestra at his fingertips. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why you know, he, he kept that orchestra even though it you know, it cost it him cost a fortune, yes. and he kept them on salary even when they were not working, yeah. because he wanted that to be there yeah. when he had music that he wanted to hear. And yeah. of course, that's it. and we're lucky that he did that. Yeah. And of course, when he wasn't recording for a label, he recorded stuff for himself. Yeah. We have we have that whole treasure trove of things. Yeah. It's. Uh, so, uh, Duke, how do you manage to keep these great musicians with you for such a long time? So, Duke said, I've got a gimmick. <laughs> I give them money. <laughs> <laughs> and then being with him, I understood, you know, because as you said, he paid the band out of his own. There's a big literature about Ellington, of course, and there's a recent book, I don't know if you've seen it, by Terry Teachout about, about Duke, and it's become quite controversial with Ellington fans, and I think rightly so, because among other things, he says that Ellington was really not a very good piano player. I mean, he was okay, but he was no more than sort of mediocre, which is <laughs> such an idiotic thing to say, you know. Yeah. Because the sound alone that yeah. he got out of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, listening, listening to listening to, to Ellington, and uh, like you say, the sound, but but the concept. I was listening now to. Uh, 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 what what did we just uh, um, with Ella? Yeah, Ellington. Yeah. You know, Ellington, the songbook. Ellington. And one of the things that I Ellington, uh, that I learned from Ellington was this comping. You know, how to accompany a singer or or the soloist, and it was quite incredible because if you if you, if you look, it's just like a simple song like. Uh, uh, do nothing to hear from me. Yeah. So there's the basic, uh, the basic chords, you know. But what it does, 
is this an uh, inversion of the cause and, and runs with you I've never I never heard or never thought of. Mm -hmm. But it 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 uh, it does not interfere with with the spirit mm -hmm. of, of the vocalist. A lot of accompanists uh, you know will overcrowd the yeah. things he plays in the in the cracks in an arrangement, you know, where there's yeah. sort of just perfect. Uh, yeah. Enhancing. So as a pianist, I'm, I mean, I'm only listening to Ellington, and, and we're always stunned. So why didn't I think about that? So I, I, can, I can imagine this as a negative uh, uh, response from these people about his his biography. Right. But I mean, that is all because they said Monk couldn't play either. Right. <laughs> and right. Monk. And Monk was really loved Ellington. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. When you listen to the 1930s small group recordings, yeah. where Duke sometimes you know stretches out a yeah. little more, you can hear stuff that Monk picked up yeah, from sure. him. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then uh, was it Herbie, Nich Herbie Nichols, oh. and also Ellington, mm -hmm. Ellington lover. And then he was the one that really, the first musician to endorse. To endorse Monk. Monk, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've seen that magazine. There was a magazine called Music Dial, which yeah. was published by black musicians in Harlem. It was a unique yeah. magazine, it was the only one of its kind. Yeah. It lasted a couple of years, and yeah. it started in, in, in the mid 40s, or early 40s, 43. And yeah. Herbie wrote a column to him, and that's oh, where he okay. mentions Monk. Monk yeah. First time he got mentioned in print. Yeah. yeah. No. Ah, I, was, I was sick that out. Did you meet Herbie? Did you, did you know? But, did no, you, I didn't. No. I mean, but <laughs> I tried to play all these yeah. tunes, even in South Africa, you know, <laughs> that uh, the 10 inch, yeah. Yeah, the blue note. Those yeah. Ten inches. Uh, yeah. incredible. <laughs> the first time I went to Japan, you remember those little jazz clubs that they had, the size of postage stamps all over Japan, and I played this uh, in Hakodate, way up in the in the winter. In the snow. And I go into this club, little small little club, and the guy says, he, <laughs> he says to me, uh, "I've got everything." I say, Herbie Nichols, 10-inch blue note, I got it. <laughs> and how could that be? So I realized then that, I mean, the, this music resonated well beyond, beyond yeah. borders that we, that yeah. we maybe created for ourselves. And yeah. so when I was, uh, uh, when I first heard uh, uh, B, I, I tried to play some of his tunes, you know, the third world, uh, Omibas dance, uh, Anitra's dance. You know. But then already he was pushing, he was, you know, he was pushing the boundaries. Well, it's lucky that Blue Note recorded her because uh, otherwise there would only be a tiny amount of yeah. stuff of his. He didn't have much luck. Uh, he was such a nice man. I, yeah. I met him through. Uh, Roswell Rudd. Roswell, Roswell yeah. and Steve Lacey yeah. loved Herbie. Yeah. 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 So tell me, what are you, what is the next thing you are about to do? Well, tomorrow we, we go to New York, we're there for a few days, and then we go to, with a band, with Ekai and Seven Piece, we, we do a, a U.S. tour. We go to San Francisco, Seattle, uh, where else are we going? Up uh, Dakota, Dakota Jazz Club. I haven't been there for years, uh -huh. uh, Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, Phoenix at the, the, music, uh, the music museum. Mm. Yeah, mm. so it's a tour until about the ninth of May. Then I go back to, to Germany and then we go to, I go to South Africa to do this project with you, Masekela, with uh, Ekaya, my band, and, and Masekela. We do two mm -hmm. nights. And it is a commemoration or maybe a, a revisiting of the jazz episode. Uh, uh, 
recording that we did in, in, in the late 50s. And this is going to be perhaps uh, uh, the, 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 the beginning of a curriculum for an academy that, uh, uh, that we have been planning and working on for many, for many years. And it looks now as if uh, we have some, or we've been having the support from, from, from government and um, my, my, and, uh, my uh, suggestion to them was that we should really invest in an academy. Yeah. And it looks as if we, we have it together. So, so uh, coming, coming to, uh, to, to the Library of Congress, everybody knows that I'm here. <laughs> And that I'm meeting with you, uh, and and also how we can create this uh, some kind of a synergy, you know, because be, uh, with this incredible uh, uh, wealth of of material that is here, you know, especially in terms of, uh, of creating a, a, an academy, yeah. uh, especially for for young for, for young musicians. Yeah. yeah, we we really we need. Good, good teachers. We need uh, yeah. to transmit the tradition. And yes. Yeah. So we've been doing it with Ekaya, you know, with my with the band. Whenever we wherever we travel, and like I said, I guess we have workshops. And so you we've do been clinics and stuff. Clinics. Yeah. The problem is that there's no follow through. Uh -huh. You see. Uh -huh. So you do it after a concert or, and, and then, then it's gone. Mm. So there's no, follow, there's no follow through. And this is what we uh, you know, that we need, need this academy. And of course, uh, uh, total agreement that the most important uh, aspect of this is getting the, 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 the teachers and mentors who firstly know the tradition and uh, who are passionate about it. Yeah. So I think, I think we've, we've, we, uh, there's a visit here yeah, to uh, to uh, the Library of Congress has opened up many many possibilities, and mm. and also speaking to, speaking to you and understand uh, your your expertise and and your your this remarkable knowledge that you have of uh, of, uh, of of the music and the and, and its environment. You know? yeah. I've just been very lucky because I never thought when I was first became interested in jazz, you know, from recordings and see, I had the good luck of seeing Fats Waller in Copenhagen when I was not quite nine years old, and he blew me away. You know? <laughs> but I never thought for a long time that I would be able to make a living out yeah. of that. But I started writing and then it's just one thing led to another and yeah. you know, it's a blessing to have been able to make a living in something that you really love yeah. and the music is so you know, I st I still, you know, I still get get a kick out of my Louis Hot Fives and other <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's so remarkable how, how how the music touches people. The, um, there's a filmmaker, John Irvin. He's asked me to do to write some music for for a film, and we were talking about. He said when he was 14 years of age, he heard Ellington in London, and there was a singer with him. He was a blind singer, but he never knew what he was. And I said, Al Hibbler. Yeah. No, and that led me to the Liberian Suite. Uh -huh. You see? Uh, uh, with uh, with uh, Al Hibbler singing, I like the I sun. I love the sunrise. Yeah, yeah. And him being yeah. blind. You see? Yeah. So I'm thinking with well, the Duke's Liberian Suite, I don't know if, it's, if it is performed much. No. But that is one of the works, for example, like, like uh, the project in South Africa, you see, mm -hmm. the Liberian, the Liberian suit, and, and get this, uh, this uh, interconnectedness that has happened, happened with, uh, with the music. Uh, and especially, for, especially for, 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 for teaching, in the for it to be in the curriculum. So we can understand that the, the, the music in, in, in the diaspora is far and wide. 
Yeah, there's such a wealth of stuff, such a treasure trove of, of music that could be yeah. introduced to people, and especially to young musicians who yeah. very often are totally amazed when they <clears throat> come into contact with some of the past that, you know, we had uh, at uh, Rutgers University where there is a master's program in jazz history. You know, yeah. And then somebody saying they heard for the first time Weatherbird, which is that beautiful thing with Earl Hines and Louis together. And said, they were doing that in 1928. <laughs> <laughs> you know. yeah. 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 yeah, I think I agree is absolutely imperative that we that at some the, there must be some vehicle that this could, uh, this uh, should be should be passed on to the younger generation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been wonderful to see you again, <laughs> and I hope it won't be <laughs> another then. sixty years. <laughs> God, it was so and, good to see uh, you then. And thank uh, you for this. Huh? Thank you for I, your time. I look forward to uh, hearing more of your beautiful music, thank you. live and on recordings. You're welcome. And all the best to you. We're, we're both, I'm a little older than Abdullah. We're both yeah. octogenarians, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're still doing it, right? Still doing it. We are blessed. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.